to really tell our chapters that we care about them. And because of that, sometimes it's really hard for us to um, find the chapter love. So we said, you know what? That's perfect for Valentine's Day. Let's talk about it. Um, all right. I'm seeing lots of chat coming in. I'm loving chocolate. Um, all kinds of – someone has said, are you talking? And I'm hoping that people are hearing me, but it sounds to me like folks aren't. So let me do a real quick test. Can anybody hear me, or am I talking to myself in a vacuum? Yep, you're fine now. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> you know, um, I've got office mates here. We're actually in an open office area, so they could hear me. So they're delighted now that you can hear me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have to be talking just to them. All right, welcome again. A hashtag chapter love as we talk about how do we decipher um, a better relationship with our chapters. And I want to make sure to introduce to you the folks that you can't see on camera are the lovely foursome from Bill Highway there. Um, uh, Mark, Charlotte, uh, Sarah, and Paige, they're always um, right behind the scenes. Sometimes they don't show their faces, but they should. Say hello to all of them. Um, and of course, I'm delighted to be able for Peter and I to be able to be part of this project. He's not showing his face either, but um, he will next month when we have a, our next chat. Um, so, anyway, why the love hate? Um, you know, it's all of us have a moment when we love our chapters and a moment when we hate our chapters. Type in whether or not it's 50 50 love hate 60 40 60 percent love 40 percent hate is it 10 90 <laughs> type in tell us what is the ratio of your love hate now is it not true we've talked to some folks and we went around and we looked at uh, we looked at and listened to some what people were saying and we really found that Sometimes it's a lack of respect, sometimes it's misunderstanding, miscommunications, assumptions, sometimes it's just one person, right? And they feel like you did an institutional slight against them. Wow, that just takes us in the long areas, which oftentimes is caused, of course, by an inflamed ego. Maybe it's just hearsay, but it's cultural truth, right? Um, lack of a common goal. We're going to talk a little bit more about that one. The parent-child mindset, come on, all of us are a little bit maybe guilty of that. And then, of course, you know, you always have the staff member that says they're difficult and the chapter leader says, and I don't understand, so just that, that back and forth of miscommunication. Can we just say that the bottom line is we're not in it together? Because I think that that's oftentimes what happens. So whenever you describe the worst possible relationships, and I see some 50-50, I see some 60-40s, whenever we peel back the onion, it comes down to the words us and them or us versus them. It's a kind of a mindset. And when it afflicts both the staff and the leaders, everybody loses. I mean, actually, the biggest loser are your members because part of what the chapters do is allow us to have that face-to-face -face opportunity with some incredibly important people, aka the members of the local level. Um, and if there's this uh, us versus them, or if this notion of we're not in this together, you know, it's going to be like the ant pushing up a rock up the hill in order for us to be able to achieve the goals, to serve the members, to meet the mission. Um, which is what we're all here for. Now, you, the cycle of just kind of a low expectation will continue, um, and things will continue to fester um, as long as we allow this love-hate relationship to, to to stay. So what we want to do today is how can we shift that, right? How can we move from this idea of, of, of love-hate to love-love? How can we show the love? to get the love back because after all you have to make if you really care you have to be the one that reaches the hand so we're going to do that today we're going to talk about two critical elements building trust and the kind of keystone of that which is communications and we're going to talk about four different kind of strategies that you can take a look at and then let's talk about the leaders themselves so that's the agenda today that 
hope, hopefully you're going to be using that chat box and, of course, the polling so that this is just not Peggy saying some beautiful things, but it's all of us showing the love for each other by sharing content and everything. And I love, Sarah, thank you. It is a difference in expectations, a huge part of what creates that love-hate relationship. Let's go with a poll. With a poll. I want to hear a little bit about what's causing your heartburn. Sarah, do you want to launch that first poll? Wonderful. Okay. So what's causing your heartburn? It's multiple choice, but is it mismatched expectations? Is it too many expectations? Maybe it's you don't have that organizational CEO support, right? Could it be poor communications? I mean, like, come on. It could be on our side. Could be on their side. Could be history, at least in the minds of some folks. Maybe it's just not enough resources, which I makes me say, is that because you're missing a CEO support? <laughs> Oftentimes, that's what that is. But go ahead, uh, weigh in, and then tell us, um, you know, what are you seeing? What's getting in the way? What's creating your heartburn? So we got a lot of folks ch chiming in right now. Awesome. Pretty cool. All right. Sharing results. So it looks like just by a hair, the history. You know what? That's the worst part. Um, I'll never forget, I was, a um, long time ago, I was chatting with a, um, actually, a wonderful consultant who was helping us with a membership remodel back in a trade association. And to this particular point about history, this individual said to me as we were talking, he said, you know, when you're working with members and you're working with chapters, um, you have a bank account. And over time, sometimes that bank account gets withdrawn. Well, it takes quite a while to get enough money back in there for it to begin to earn interest. And I, that's always kind of stayed with me that we really have to work really hard and is about continuing to give and give and give and not withdraw again until we've got enough to begin earning that interest. So I love the fact that we're all facing it. 52% of you mentioned that missed or poor communications is really clear. Interesting that not much was um, missing the support. Not too many people saying not enough resources. All right. Well, it is mismatched experience, communications, and history. So let's talk a little bit about how you can get around, get away from that. Let's start by taking a look at um, a common conversation that I think we need to have, which is that national, national organizations have not done a particularly good job of figuring out how to make groups true partners. You see, when I was um, interviewed by the associations now and they asked me what is the real issue, um, I said to them, you know, at the end of the day, um, as long as we're parent-child, as long as we're in this um, conversation of where we're separate, we're never going to be able to pull together. It's actually finding a way to create those collaborative partners. Um, part of what happens is um, the chapters don't feel respect, and when they don't feel or sense that respect, um, they become the rival. And so part of what we need to do is to recognize the chapters, the leaders in them, have some egos, and then and, – and, Sometimes we're asking them to do things that they're either embarrassed or too proud to ask for. And so how do we create this and create the collaborative program? Well, let's talk about trust and let's talk about communications. Let's start with the, with the most important aspect of this, which is actually building trust. It's absolutely necessary. And the trust comes from a series of actions. It comes from the words. But most importantly, it comes from the repetition of all of that. There are four things we can do to build trust. Now, these are not the only four things, but when we've talked to people who've actually been able to turn around this conversation, um, these are the kinds of things that really make a difference. And it was kind of interesting when we looked at these, uh, and we actually talked with Gary LeBranch from the um, American Corporate Council. I've talked with um, some folks. I, I saw some, Matt Schroeder here from CRS when you've talked about some, what some of the approaches that, that their CEO has done. It's really interesting that sometimes we kind of overlook a few things. The most important is just this notion of sharing chapter success stories, not just with chapters, but with the national colleagues. 
That's right. Part of getting rid of the us versus them mentality has to do with being able to have the conversation internally as well as with your chapter leader. So sometimes we do all this stuff. If you ever seen it, we have this great program. It's a chapter leader um, uh, program, and we do uh, an awards at lunch, and we share all of the success stories. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm not saying don't do that, but it's the staff not in the room that haven't heard that that still carry that us versus them mentality. Find them to be burdensome. I send them out stuff and they don't reply kind of thing. So I thought that was really interesting with this notion of the trust really has to come from, from us almost more than it has to come from the, the, the chapters themselves. And it's not just us. You know, those of us in this room right now, man, we get this. But have you thought about sending just a quick little email out to key staff saying, hey, by the way, I just wanted you to know that the Chicago chapter did this and took it to the next level. Yay, rah, yay, rah. <laughs> Again, sharing that love. The second thing I thought was pretty amazing was this idea of trying transparency. Okay, so one of the interesting things is that chapters, if they're if they have an exec, sometimes that exec is more, we know, a secretary or a or an admin person, or there was an AMC and they're, you know, they're good, they're good association exec person, but they're managing a bunch of different things. So they don't have a lot of time and they don't spend time really understanding some of the things that we do at the national organization. There's this kind of veil of secrecy, if you will. So this came from another person who said that they really said, you know, we're going to pull back the curtain. We're going to let the chapters begin to see a little bit about the inside workings of the organization. And they did this in a couple of ways. So um, first and foremost, this particular organization had a conversation. Um, the CRP there would call up chapter leaders and say, hey, what questions do you have about the organization? What don't you know? Um, and sticking all kinds of things like, well, we don't understand. The board sends us a policy, but we don't understand how that policy came to. Or we never know when the board's meeting, so if we have, a, if we have an issue, we never know when, it, when it's going to be addressed. Hmm. So one of the things that they did was to simply say, you know what? Let's pull a character of secrecy about, away from the board meeting. And they did basically a video of part of their board meeting and shared with the chapter leaders, this is what happens at a board meeting. This is how conversations are made. Now, maybe that's too risky for you. I get it. I understand. Um, one of the alternatives then is to get the chair to maybe do a quick video as he's going into the board meeting. Hey, we're going into the board meetings. You know, our chapters are really important to us. One of the things we're going to discuss is X, Y, and Z. Hope to, hope to be chiming with you afterwards a little bit more about that. So do a video. Or beyond all of that, just do a video greeting to your chapters where you have a board chair or someone, maybe it's the CEO, talk about what the, what the, how the organization is working. Maybe it's not about the board. Maybe it's about something else. So another example is I know a number of you have organizations where you, where you process the, the CEs for your um, local chapters for their education programs. Oftentimes, um, folks don't understand what that process is. So I remember um, when I worked back with the diabetes educators, and I don't know if anybody's on the phone from the diabetes educators, but a long time ago, we were working with creating a new uh, chapter model with them. And one thing that came up in the task force was this idea of, well, you need to make the CE process easier. Okay, that's fair enough, but do you know what the CE process is? So we walked this group through what the CE process was. You saw these, bam, eye opens. Then they began to strategize. They did actually create a little bit more flexibility in the system. But what was great was this incredible conversation. So anyway, just take from that this notion that sometimes there's this because they don't understand what's going on. The third thing is make it personal. Put faces to the names of national staff. Now, I know that there are some cases where, you know, we want to our um, staff members don't want their pictures up there or we don't want to put the email addresses. And I understand all of that. Take a big snapshot of your, of your, um, of your key staff and put it up on the slide deck at your next uh, chapter meeting. Um, point out some folks, you know, um, you know, uh, mess all about the communications and, and Kelly really is the person to go to on our publications and, Sarah does a lot of our e-learning. Let them see that. But more importantly, get people in front of it. 
So I don't know how many of you, and go ahead and type in here, how many of you do road trips where you go out and you get a chance to see the chapters out in the field? Type it in, tell us about it. And then while you're doing that, also share, do you ever grab a staff member and take them along? Because a great way is to take a staff member. Let's, let's take, for example, your, your um, learning or education person. And let's say you're going to visit a chapter. And maybe you're visiting two chapters and you're, take, you're coming down to the D.C. area. You're from Chicago. You're going to fly into D.C. You're going to see your Maryland chapter, your D.C. chapter, and you're going to see someone in Virginia. So, yes, so you say to the education person, hey, I'm going to spend two and a half days down in D.C. Come on with us. Let me introduce you around. Would that be great? I mean, that's, that is one way of really helping staff members get out there. Ah, Sarah, we visit them only if there's a special purpose hmm, or a problem. <laughs> I love it. It does take, and Kylie, thank you. You do your chapter um, relations managers get out there five chapters a year. I love that. We have three CRMs and 100 chapters are getting around. Beautiful. Yes, Diana, absolutely. We got to get those road trips. So here's a flip on it is um, Karen or Sandra or anybody from CAI, because I want to give you a serious um, shout out. So this is what CAI does. It's part of their, one of their, um, their uh, chapter uh, programs, they bring them into the DC area and they spend one day or maybe it's one morning. <laughs> They'll correct me if they're on the phone. They actually take their, leaders and take them into the office and they do basically what I would call a your, your good old-fashioned um, speed dating. You get a chance to go into the office of the CEO, go into the office of the COO, go into the database manager's office and have a cool conversation. And they walk them all the way through the building. They put really cool um, footsteps on the floor. They move people around. Wow, it was mind blowing the difference they found in how conferences, how how leaders were communicating, reacting, collaborating with staff. I mean, it's just great. What I what I would loved about this was this idea that that they chapter leaders could get face to face, see the workspace, see how busy the office was. Kylie, you do something similar. You know, social network where each intro has a table. I love it. So that's another way of doing this. Um, I love both of these options because when you take people into the office at HQ, right, they see a different perspective. They see the humans in the building. So great. So try that. I mean, and, um, and if Karen or Sandra or someone isn't here from CAI, reach out. Karen is a great resource on some really cool opportunities. All right. Fourth and final is this notion of frequent communications. I know that we have a really, really tough time. Hey, Kelly, thanks. <laughs> um, ask Kelly whatever you want <laughs> from CAI. So the um, communication, so communications. Now, we know these volunteers and these execs are really, really busy. Um, my suggestion is, and I've seen a couple of associations do this, if you can consider like a um, Friday news or, or, or I'm trying to take something that rhymes with, um, with chapter, like a, a Tuesday chapter, chap, chapter chat email, um, get in the habit of sending out a communication on a pretty regular basis. Do not spend time wordsmithing this. It's a quick, hi from Chicago, hi from the snowy banks of, um, of Minneapolis, shoreline, hi from, um, you know, from um, the middle of Maryland, um, and just give them one or two things. And it's don't make sure these emails are not, here's a deadline that you have to adhere to, here's a checklist item that you have to do, I didn't hear from you. You know, registration is almost over and you haven't registered. No, none of that. Just make it a really good um, regular check-in. Um, and then, of course, build with that maybe a quarterly phone calls or a web conference. Depending upon your people, that may or may not be as easy as possible. But let's stay on this communication just a moment because one of the things we understand is how critical communications is. One of the things that I did recently at a leadership conference with some chapters is we had a great little chat about 
what is a good relationship? And it was someone said to me, um, and then I just love that um, Sarah said the same thing when she said, well, you know, it's kind of like that relationship with your significant other, right? How would your relationship fare if your communication style was infrequent or one way or indifferent, right? How would it be if it was, you know, that invasive and imperious or worse, silence? Yeah. So let's find out what you guys are doing. What do you do that strengthens specifically the communications with your chapters? Get your fingers warmed up, throw it into the chat. What do you do that strengthens the communications with your chapters? How do you get beyond that relationship that's kind of hit or miss, right? Um, one of the things that um, a good friend of mine said to me with her, with her husband, they're kind of always moving in, in different directions. And she said to me that there's one, they put a, they did some chalkboard paint on a, um, on a door. And one of the things that they made a, made a um, habit of doing was writing a note to each other. So that's just kind of like the email that you're writing to each other, right? Great. Uh, Samantha, excellent. Thank you. The Leader Connection newsletter goes out monthly. Includes a great. Come on, guys. Tell us what else strengthens the communication. Where have you gotten a high five from a volunteer leader? Where have they felt your love and you felt the shine that went with it? Listening sessions with our CEO, Elsie. Awesome. Keep typing. Tell us a little bit more about those listening sessions because talk about being able to sit back and have a conversation. How important is that? Now, Let's talk just a little bit about the communications trust, and we're going to get into that listening conversation as well. Keep typing monthly newsletters, in-person meetings. Thank you, Paula. Tell us a little bit more about those in-person meetings. Three elements about building trust that I want to sort of highlight. These are tips that I've picked up in, in, from my days as a CRP um, and from talking to other CRPs that are really rocking it. One is to respect their time. Um, over and over and over and over again, when I have the opportunity to be in a room with your chapter volunteer leaders, I hear this, well, they want us to get turnaround time. They just don't understand that we've got a job. I remember sitting in a, in a group with, and I won't say the name of the organization, but we, had, we were in the bar afterwards, and we were talking about the session I had done on, on volunteer love, and the person said, well, my biggest beef is that we, they don't understand that we need more time when they send us stuff. And I said, well, I know, but if we give you too much time, then it gets buried and you forget it. And they go, yeah, but you could give us time and then find an easy way to remind. And I thought, okay, well, I thought we were doing that. But the more I talked about it, I realized that, that what she was talking about was the timing of when things hit in that particular profession. Fridays were an amazingly busy day, and Monday were an amazingly busy catch-up day. And for them, Tuesday after lunch was the best time to respond to them. But this person said to me in this particular profession that the most important thing you could do was make sure that they had a week to 10 days for response. So I don't know how that's going to be for you guys, but understand that we have to give them more time. Um, that we need to add items to meeting agendas that will actually respect their time. We have to acknowledge people to get in. We have to start new initiatives. Now, customer service conundrum, all aside, they expect immediate response from you. And so part of respecting their time is not just giving them that time and understanding what time is good for them, but it's also about making sure things are readily available at the moment of need. So we're going to talk a little bit when we talk about um, your chapter leaders is about how do we, that building in the resource portal, but making sure things are accessible at the moment of their need so that you don't have to be there. Um, one additional note on this, so um, I'm respecting their time. So I'm doing a series of uh, webinars. Um, we're calling them um, chats. Um, member engagement chats for um, ADHA, the dental hygienist. I don't think they would mind you me telling you this. We're doing one um, one webinar a month for four months, and we're having a blast. When they first told me though that it had to be done at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, I was like, "That's when I'm drinking my wine." <laughs> but you see. I bought into that without a problem. Do you want to know why? Not that I want you all asking me to do webinars at <laughs> Eastern time. 
but that's when their members could be accessible. And last night we, we started it and I said, Hey guys. And we talked, I talked about getting around the table for a chat. So I said, we're getting around the table for a chat. What are you drinking tonight? Well, we had somebody with a peach brandy hot toddy. We had somebody with a cool long glass of red wine. We have lots of ginger tea and some peach tea. But anyway, it was, it was understanding and respecting their time. So I know it can be difficult. One of the things to talk about with your office is maybe flex time. So if you have to do calls and stuff at late at night, you know, can you have the morning to do the chores and the things that you would have been doing then to spend the extra time with your own kids as you get outside the door? Show your chapters are on their side. Um, this is really letting chapters under letting chapters know you understand the challenges. One of the most powerful things is to say, you know, truly, truly, I hear you. Um, I don't know how to help you at this point, but I do hear you. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what is working and maybe there's something out of what's working I can use to apply where it's not working. Just having that kind of a personal conversation that allows you to say, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I can do. Um, the, the showing uh, chapters that, that um, that they're on your side is also about making sure that you are reaffirming their value to, and, and asking what resources would ease the, the chapter volunteer leader workload. I bet most of you do that. Let me ask this question to folks. Go ahead and chat in. When, um, when you've talked to folks, how do you show the chapters that, that you're on their side? What else do you do to show the chapters that you're on their side? Go ahead and type it in. I bet there's some really cool ideas. And while I'm doing that, let me add the final point to here, which is to establish a safe pace for honest communications. Um, um, here's the one thing that I would say um, is that if you let things go unsaid, they fester. If you skirt difficult topics because of political or cultural concerns, they fester. So one of the things that I'm going to really suggest that, um, that you spend time doing is, is asking yourself, what are the places, those really kind of raw places or those critical conversations that are not being, that are not being addressed? And spend some time brainstorming with your team about how you can address those, how you can provide a safe place for the communications. Now, it could be that you bring in a facilitator somebody who can navigate the conversation. Um, maybe, in one organization I'm working with right now, we've created a separate um, uh, area to have a great dynamic conversation that was gonna bring up some, some, some really difficult um, pushback, was gonna bring up some you know, finger wagging. We gave them a whole um, list of discussion and it's been very, very valuable. We've heard things and we're actually now seeing people come back and go, well, wait a minute, what about encountering some of those issues? So I think that one of the coolest things we can do is create a safe pace for communication. Now, if you have an online community, that could be it. Um, maybe at a regularly scheduled meeting, you pull people along and you have a door where a closed door conversation where you can have, where you can do that. Maybe you bring in a facilitator. Um, maybe you have the old-fashioned um, comment box on your website at an event. Um, try at your next chapter leaders event having a little box, comment box, things that you want to make sure get discussed. So that's going to be critical for us to build the trust. Now, all of this is going to work when we're listening. Um, I use this great picture um, when I'm trying to get people to really understand this notion, when I'm doing a, a program on this, or when I'm helping, you know, a chapter leaders um, think about how they can learn more about their members. And I always say, it's this dog with these great big floppy ears. And I always say the reason why we have two of these and one of these is so we could spend much more time um, listening. So let's find some new ways to listen to your chapters. Love to hear how you're listening to the chapters. So keep chatting in here. How are you listening to the chapters? And here are some ideas that we've picked up along the way. Obviously, 
the the ask for feedback on the in in person when you can. I love this dynamic here of a fishbowl where you let everybody come in, state their issue, and then they sit back down again, and we have a dialogue about it, and then someone else stands up and states the issue. Um, great way to do feedback in an in person environment. Um, one of the very cool things, I've been using Poll Everywhere quite a bit, and it's been awesome. We've been able to clear the air on a couple of different elements just by allowing people to um, anonymously do some uh, responses to some questions. Email, that anonymous online suggestion box came out of um, another organization that was doing that, actually started doing it for their whole membership and found that it was really valuable to have one for chapter leaders as well. Secondly, Maybe it's a one question poll to give an opportunity with an opportunity to say more. Um, so um, maybe this is really an opportunity for you to go out and say, for example, um, if there's a if there's a question about um, the CEs, how CEs are processed, um, what is the one pain point in the CE processing system today? That's all you're asking them. You're not sending them a survey with a whole bunch of things. You know, you can do this actually through email, but you could do this easily through um, SurveyMonkey. Um, you could actually use a MailChimp. You could do it through a um, uh, Wufu. Uh, lots of different free places where you can just go out and then be able to capture that information. Then you can go back in your next chapter leader newsletter and say something like, hey, we asked, and the th top three issues for the CE process were A, B, and C, and we actually have a solution for A. We're looking for your comments on B, and C can't be changed because. Awesome. They know that you said something. You have this great piece that is in the moment. Cassandra, I love it. You're working on a whole new chapter program. Okay, so um, Sarah and Charlotte, let's note that because we want to come back around to Cassandra and find out more about that. But a uh, virtual town hall, actually, we're going to talk about that in just a moment because I think that is really, really incredible. Um, arrange leader to leader conversations. So the virtual town hall is another way of doing it, but also allowing your leaders to get out there and talk with folks. Um, the, and the final thing is that virtual town halls for chapter leaders. So the one group that I'm working with right now, we are having um, virtual town hall meetings. We've done a couple for members, for all members. We've done a couple with groups of some chapter leaders. And then we've also, though, done the virtual uh, listening tour where we're actually meeting with each chapter um, in a virtual way because we can't get around the country in the amount of time that we want to do this listening tour. So we're basically meeting virtually. We're using Zoom, so we're all sitting around a, a virtual table. We can see each other. We can have great conversations. Um, so let me ask this question because, Cassandra, you've mentioned the virtual town hall. I'd love to talk more about it, but if you've got anything that you can chat in and, and talk to us a little bit about, like, what technology are you using? Um, you know, how are you perhaps, how, how long is it going to be? Are you going to do multiple? You know, just share any of those things, but we'll also chat with you a little bit more because the virtual town hall is a great way for us to get other staff involved in listening to the organization. So great ideas here um, about about the listening. What other listening things do you guys do? Anything else? Okay, let me ask the question differently. <laughs> when was the last time you asked chapters for your input? Yes, Amy, great. That's what we do have to ask. Perfect. Um, let's put the poll up there. There we go. When was the last time you asked chapters for their input? Was it in the last six months? Was it last year? Uh, never. We're thinking about it. Now, the reason why we have another and where we're thinking about it is because you're not sending out letters, sending out letters or emails telling people what to do um, is not asking for input. So we're talking about really engaging chapter leaders in a thought process that really helps you find out what's going on. I love it, April. So yes, I would consider that if liaisons are doing quarterly personal phone calls, and as they're doing those personal phone calls, they are connecting 
and bringing that information and data back and folks are seeing how that organizes back into decisions, definitely that is truly adding. So most of you have done this in the last six months, which is awesome. The question is, how can we do it more regularly? Or how can we get that opportunity throughout the year? So what I really liked about what you said, April, was the quarterly personal phone calls means that you're getting in stuff on a regular basis, which is really cruel. Okay, Paula, you had them provide feedback on the strat plan. I need to hear more about that. So if you can type a little bit more, but then let's connect offline. Um, you know, guys, just a little side story here. Um, Part of the reason why we do these webinars is so that you guys will tell us what stories you have to share. And we'd love to have an opportunity to sit down and talk with any of you that have a story to share, even if you don't think it's perfect, if you think it's, man, we're on the right track even. So Paula, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you did the strategic plan. Um, and Carolyn, oh great. Tell us a little bit more about how you did the idea. Last week, you did ideas in our long-term strategy. How did you get those ideas? What did you do? What did you do? Okay, awesome. Anyway, I love that you, most of you have done it in the last six months, but let's maybe talk a little bit about how we can do it more frequently. So one of the things we wanted to talk about here is that if the chapters are truly going to be partners in delivering your member value, right? The partners have to have common goals. They have to have mutually agreed upon expectations. And so one of the things you can do to get that information coming in in more regular basis is maybe create little task forces where you can get the chapter's voice on goals and strategies. So this is also engaging your volunteers in a different kind of an opportunity. So the bonus to doing this is besides the fact that you get their input, right? There's also a bonus here in leadership development if you're looking at how do I use my chapter leaders of the farm team. So that's a little kind of a little aside, but let's talk about it. So an optimal kind of a pulling this together would be to make sure you have a diverse group of chapters. And then be clear on the ask. Um, sometimes when we do these things, people have the expectation that whatever I tell you, you're going to act on. But really talk about the fact that this is for thoughts, it's for input. So part of this is the when. If you bring them in after decisions are made and you're doing it as a gut check, that's fine. But tell them it's a gut check. Just make sure that, um, that what you don't do is do them after things can't be changed and then they have the implication they're going to make changes. So um, there was a group that I worked with, and we did a listening tour. We created the changes into a document and went back out for a listening tour. So make sure that when you're doing this, that you set the scope right so that you really understand. The first listening tour for us was all about um, understanding what wasn't clear. And understanding rocks in the middle of the road and the plan was the concepts were not even finalized yet so anyway so the ask is be clear on the asks um and make sure that the goal is really um it's, a, it's to be a sounding board. You're not creating, this is not creating a governance structure. I'm not talking about your chapter committee here. I'm not talking about your board representation. I'm really talking about making sure you're hearing the chapter voice on organizational goals and strategy. You do not want to set this up as a sense of, again, that you're going to, that it's going to make a huge deal. Now, part of this is expectation setting. So one of the things you can do here that I've seen a couple of groups do really well is take this as an opportunity to um, get a temperature check on the expectations, right? So um, what is national expecting of chapters? What is chapters expecting of national? What are the overall um, connection points? What are the things that have to be done? What are the hard walls? Um, what are the soft or, or movable walls? Um, anyway, uh, this advisory group or task force is a great way for you to put fresh ideas in front of them to build credibility for tactics, um, to roll things up to chapters, um, just a really cool idea. So suggest that you could make sure you're bringing the chapter voice in at different times. Uh, Cassandra, thanks for some information you're sending us. We're going to follow up on all of that. So let me pause for a moment because that is a very informal group. I'm curious to find out from you guys 
where do your chapters currently have a voice in the organization? Because I'm talking about how do you give them the voice in addition to that. So let's do that poll. Um, and we're going to ask you to tell us whether or not, you know, if maybe your governing board is made up of chapters. Okay, so it's a chapter representation representative board. Perfect. Maybe you have designated seats on the board, like two or three or chapter seats. Um, maybe you have designated seats on committees, right? You could have a House of Delegates or something similar to that. Uh, maybe you have a chapter committee or something similar to that. Maybe you have none of the above. So we're just looking for it. When you think about your formal structure in your organization, where are there places for the chapters to be seen as a chapter, heard as a chapter, and presumably the voice of the chapter? Um, because I, I think that some of these are really good. But I think sometimes that they become a governing structure. And so what happens is we don't do a good job of, of really capturing the voice. Um, so I see that about 44% of you have a chapter committee or something similar. Some folks here have a House of Delegates. Those were the two stronger ones. Um, so I think, particularly for those of you who said none of the above, this idea of these pop-up advisory groups or these um, or these task forces is a great way of doing a visible way of an outreach and getting that. But getting the voice, see here's what we're talking about here, is getting the voice on a specific issue, being able to talk directly to the question at hand. It's your strat plan. It's your um, your um, latest initiative. It's a, maybe you're looking at a new certification. Maybe you're looking at developing an online education program. Maybe you're looking at, you know, revamp of a publication. It's to get their voice at the moment of. So it feels very, um, there's an urgency and intentionality out of it. That's what's different than a chapter committee, which is just kind of like they're looking at over things over there. So for those of you that have none, maybe this is a great way of doing that. But for even those of you that have some, maybe this is a way of getting out the, at the moment of need conversation. Thanks, by the way, Cassandra, for um, um, sharing some stuff. We look forward to being able to um, get some more information to folks there. Um, okay, so my question I have to you, or, or to to you, is: Are you really truly open to new ideas? Because remember, I said you were going to talk about four strategies. We talked about listen. We talked about building them into the process. Now I want to talk about three, which is being open to new ideas. We've done some really cool webinars. So go look on the Bill Highway, the Knowledge Bank, where we've got them. Where we have, um, there was one where we talked about tapping your um, your chapters as uh, in terms of social influencers, and we talked about chapters doing something and then national being part of helping them. By the way, we're going to be at um, uh, MMC and we're going to be doing a similar session at MMC, right, um, Sarah? Maybe you could throw that in there too in the chat. I'm asking Sarah to do a lot of things right here. Um, so what's interesting? is that um, in the Association Innovation Benchmarking Study that MGI did, the biggest obstacle, they said, uh, was getting people to accept a degree of failure. And part of what happens with many of our chapter ideas is we're worried about the, we're worried about the, um, will this be successful? And so it makes us pause. But here's the deal. 72% of the persons said that their association didn't have any reward or recognition for innovation. So not only was this notion of a fail, uh, worried about uh, failure, but they weren't even kind of like saying, wow, try something and we'll reward you or recognize you. So if you really want to create in innovation and be open to new ideas, embrace two things. One is the acceptance that innovation in and of itself is important and critical. And two, that you will get people less fearful if you go ahead and provide some reward or recognition to it. Um, you know, I, what I love about it is the trickle-up approach really, really does work. Um, and I love it. Thank you, um, uh, Bill Highway, for posting the, the Knowledge Bank. And maybe you can grab the trickle-up approach um, webinar that we, that we did and maybe put that one um, also on the, on the uh, chat box. Really good one because we talked with a couple of associations who had great examples about that. All right. 
Um, item number four, besides being open to new ideas, and actually, um, if anyone's done a really new idea, tell us what you're doing. Um, oh, I'm seeing a really cool um, conversation around a focus group with chapter leaders that are particularly vocal for a deeper dive. Love that, being able to say we're going to do with all, and then we're going to grab a smaller group and get a little deeper on that. Okay. Fourth is reaffirming the common purpose. Um, I'm betting that you know this, but let me just give you a few ideas here. Um, you know, set aside one of your quarterly check-ins um, or an annual review just to say, "Hey guys, this is where we this is where we intersect. This is um, this is a relationship. This is our common goals." You know, volunteer leaders change, so don't assume that um, they onboard each other very well. And not only that, but always find that common ground is a great place, right? Um, acknowledge the strengths that each side brings. So that's the same thing as saying acknowledge the weaknesses. So that you can say, here's where we really need your support. Um, and it's a way of kind of acknowledging their strengths, but it's also a way of showing that a partnership is a partnership because nobody is whole in and of themselves. Um, together, identify ways that you cooperate on how you do that member value. How many of you were at CEX? Or came to the follow-up webinar we did on member journey mapping. Okay, that's another one that you want to look up if you weren't there. This is really the journey, member journey mapping will really help you see where the organizations intersect. So great opportunity for that. Um, okay, and documenting, documentation, um, if you don't have an affiliation agreement that works um, or you don't have a fresh one, um, if you don't have a, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a statement of a shared statement of purpose, uh, document it, because the onboarding may or may not happen, and this really gives you an opportunity to, um, you know, to make sure we all know what's going on. So reaffirm the common purpose. So let me just pause for a moment, because what we have done right now is we have talked about the critical element. Of the missing piece being trust and a critical element of building trust is communication. So we talked about a couple of different ways, but we talked specifically about four elements of communication that we can act on. We talked about listening. We talked about building them in, giving them that great opportunity to be part of, of, of the conversation, being open to new ideas. And just a very simple thing of doing that, maybe there's an award or recognition for the chapter that had provided innovation. Some of you talk about doing innovation grants, which I love. So in other words, we're, not, we're trying to find a way to share some of the revenue and we're gonna, we're gonna give you dollars if you try something new. The ASAE innovation grants, by the way, is a great model. Take a look at that. And fourth, we just talked about the common purpose. So, Four strategies, hopefully you can just take one of those home and try it. Go ahead and type in what you might try. But I wanna make sure that we take a little bit of time here before we wrap up to talk about the individual, to talk about the chapter leader and showing volunteer love because really that's really what we're talking about here is volunteer love. Supercharging your volunteer engagement takes a commitment. And that commitment on our part is really about recognizing the chapter leaders, volunteers, their, their challenges. And in taking and recognizing those challenges, it means that we have to help them find ways to prevent burnout. We have to find ways to alleviate some administrative burdens. And we have to be sure we're providing resources. You see, we can do all of the rewards and recognition, but if they're still facing burnout, if they still have all of these small things and checklists that have to be done, if they still have to agonize to get answers when we're not showing the love. So what we really want to do is don't spend as much time on figuring out how to thank them. Spend more time on figuring out how to deal with their tough issues critical way is for you to do this self-assessment of your current chapter leader training and resources. I love it. Yes, Sarah's already committed to ask for feedback from chapters on a regular basis. Totally love that. So the first thing is train chapter leaders, not doers. So really, this is, this is really critical. 
help your um, your leaders understand how to delegate, not to be a chapter superhero. We spend a lot of time teaching them, this is the bookkeeping um, SOPs, this is how you get on the database, et cetera. But do we teach them how to be delegators, okay? So take the time for that. Um, make sure that you, in order to make this as easy as possible, that you grab their attention with consistency. So whether that's that little email we talked about, whether it's the chapter leaders, it's gonna be 4 p.m. on the first Thursday of the month, or like we did with ADHA, we're gonna do a series of four, it's gonna be on this topic, it's gonna to be 8 p.m. on basically the same Wednesday evening of four months. Create that consistency, because that's addressing this, how do I find the resources, I don't have time to search for these things. Provide that chapter resource center, allow chapter leaders to search for solutions. Maybe you have a chapter play, uh, play, uh, playbook or best practices. Oh, you know what I really loved at CEX? Um, I think it was uh, Louise Burnett. Are you on here? Were you the one that, or maybe it was Samantha Herman showed us the Paltoon. I loved the little webinars that you guys did. So what they did was they created in their chapter resource center, they found some commonly asked things and they did these quick little videos and they uploaded them so that people could get a quick primer like, because here's the deal. You bring everybody together in March for your chapter leader meeting and you do a whole thing on best practice on chapter finances. But they're not doing their finances when you do that. So then um, two months later, the treasurer is out and someone has to do it or you have a new treasurer or whatever. And now they need to know what you taught them back in March. Only they can't. That's, that's in the past, right? Um, so what do you do? You have a, a video of the moment. So I'm not sure. I forget who did that, but um, if you're on the phone and you did it, in any case, I can tell you it's Powtoon, P-O-W-T-O-O-N. Great way to, to power up your chapter resource center. Facilitate peer support. Awesome, important thing to do. Um, that's through your online community. That's through having chapter staff available. And the last thing we want to talk about is, you know, listen to the council of the chapter leaders. And we've talked about those, talked about that, that before, but you can't solve for them what you don't know about. All right. I did say spend more time on those elements, and I do mean it, but I don't mean that we shouldn't thank and reward volunteers. Um, and make sure, though, that when you do this, that you're thinking about all of them. So lots of different things we've collected over time that you can perhaps do. Um, I love the, the PMI. I sent out 9,000 certificates. All oh, I remember. Huge project. But man, it began popping up on social media like crazy. So it had the additional benefit of not only thanking and recognizing it, but showing how many people were saying like, oh my God, look, all these people that volunteer, I want to be a volunteer too, right? So it really promoted the volunteer culture of the organization, which was too awesome. All right, so Sarah is not showing her face. She's not on video, but I totally love this CRP love, Be a Daring Leader. Um, she's reading this book and highly recommends it. In fact, it's now on my reading list. Thank you, Sarah. Um, but what I loved about this was this notion of, um, and this is for you as a leader, and maybe it's also for you to share to your leaders, but knowing your value, cultivating commitment and shared person, and remembering that compliance, well, are we really doing compliance right? So I love it. So take the time um, to maybe give yourself the gift, the gift, dare to lead, um, and take a look at that, read it, chat with Sarah. She's got some great ideas and insights on this. Oh, and there's another Sarah, must be a Sarah thing, who says, um, love this book. Awesome. <laughs> great. All right. So drum roll, please. Um, you know, we here at Bill Highway and Mariner, um, <laughs> we here, I just saw a really cute, um, a cute to shout out to the panelists here. Um, you know, we, we do this out of labor of love, right? Um, Sarah and Charlotte and Paige and Mark and Peter and I, gosh, you know, it sounds corny, but it is Valentine's Day and I am dressed in red for you. You notice. Um, anyway. Hashtag love. We love you guys. And part of the reason why um, we love them is we really believe that 
um, chapters are an incredible member engagement tool and that so much change is happening and so many opportunities for us to think things differently, to sharpen up those component programs. Um, and we love the fact that you guys work day in and day out for, for your volunteer leaders. Um, so um, we're going to give you some gifts in 2019, and we're pretty excited about these gifts. Now, we are asking you as a community to help us do this. So there is a registration fee. But ta-da, we are going to do two incredible workshops. We're going to do them in D.C., and we're going to do them in Chicago, and we are going to do them as an opportunity to roll our sleeves up and work on how do we make virtual chapters work. So the, they're going to be a half-day program, so you can just carve out a part of your day. Um, the really cool thing is it's going to be part us sharing with you what we have learned from some folks that are doing it, and a lot of it saying, okay, what, are the, what, what principles can we apply to creating a virtual chapter, chapter that will make a difference? And is virtual chapters going to be what we need to do? Part of what we've learned in researching for this is there's a really cool opportunity here for hybrid chapters. And we are going to explore that. So we are super, super excited to bring this gift to you. Um, we have been working like crazy on the agenda and pulling all this together. Um, just, okay. <laughs> Can I attend the virtual workshop virtually? Hmm, Heather, you know what? We need to think about that. And we'll be actually we've been talking about that in our own process. And um, actually, I'm so super excited because in two weeks, um, the Mariner Bill Highway team are getting together at the Bill Highway places in Michigan, and we're going to be nailing down this thing. So anyway, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Illinois, our labor of love to bring to you. Registration will be open soon. Please take a look at your, um, your email for that. And, of course, drum roll, please. CEX, October 18, 2019. Registration open May 1st, www.leveragechapters.com. All right, guys, I am right up at the top of the hour here. You have been fabulous. Um, hope you're feeling our love to you. We know we're feeling the love back because you guys are really appreciative of the work that, that Sarah and Paige and, and Mark and Charlotte and Peter and I are doing on behalf, on your behalf. And, you know, it's just, it's wonderful being in this community. So thank you. Um, as always, we'll have all of this online um, in, a, in a bit so that you'll be able to take any of these um, ideas, pictures, um, concepts, and use them. And as always, um, we're here for you. So tell us what else you'd like to hear about. Um, tell us what your questions are. Um, show your chapter's love, as we'll share you. Have a great day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>